Hey everyone, Professor Davis here from ChemSurvival.com and the YouTube channel ChemSurvival. And in this short video, I'm going to discuss drying organic solvents with a material known as molecular sieves. Let's start by thinking about why water can be such a problem in organic reactions in the first place. Water has lots of interesting chemistries. It can act as a weak acid, but it can also act as a weak base. You may also know from your organic chemistry class that water can be a weak nucleophile and that in certain organometallic reactions, water can act as a ligand for metals, changing their chemistry. So there are many instances in which we need to remove water from our organic solvents. So how do we go about doing that? Well, one technique involves drying them with molecular sieves. Before we get into that, Let's think about the following. You've probably worked with all three of these organic solvents in the lab, diethyl ether, methylene chloride, and chloroform. And we think of each of these three solvents as being immiscible with water, meaning they don't mix on any proportion whatsoever. But this in fact is just an assumption. All of these solvents do have limited solubility in water and water has limited solubility in them. Specifically, what I'm going to talk about in this lecture is the solubility of water in diethyl ether. It's about 0 0.015 mg per milliliter or about one and a half mass percent. Now that may not sound like much, but if we think carefully about it, we'll be able to prove to ourselves that this could be a potentially damaging amount of water to have around depending on the reaction we'd like to run. Consider this, if we have a beaker of ether that's been exposed to the atmosphere. It's drawn a certain amount of moisture in from the air. And when it, once it becomes saturated, what is the molarity of that water? That's a more useful number for us to make a comparison to our reaction concentrations. And that's not too hard to calculate. Knowing that we have one and a half grams of water per 100 milliliters of wet ether, we can simply use the molar mass of water and a quick conversion from milliliters to liters of solvent to calculate the molarity of water in wet ether. And when I run the numbers, I get almost one molar water. That's a lot of water. One molar is the concentration at which many reactions in the organic lab are run. Reactions like the Grignard reaction, which can't possibly succeed unless we find a way to remove that water from the ether. One technique that we use to remove moisture from solvents like diethyl ether is to put that solvent over molecular sieves. Molecular sieves are small pellets of inorganic materials called zeolites. These zeolites have extremely small repeating pores that are about three to five angstroms in diameter, just about the size of a typical small molecule. So if we heat these molecular sieves in a vacuum, we can drive any moisture out of them and create a situation where they act like a sponge, drawing moisture in from the solvent that we place them inside of. To understand this better, let's look at the surface of these molecular sieves at the molecular level. Here we are looking at the surface of a molecular sieve with three angstrom pores. We're going to use this to dry our wet ether. You'll notice that water and diethyl ether are naturally of different sizes. Specifically, water's kinetic molecular diameter is about 2.8 angstroms, just smaller than the three angstrom pore size for my activated molecular sieves. What this allows to happen is water fits inside of the pores very snugly. And so it can interact with that surface area and be drawn inside of the molecular sieve. But the diethyl ether molecule is much too large. It cannot physically fit inside of the pores. And so it's forced to stay on the outside in the liquid phase. By doing this, we can separate the water from the ether. So to dry wet ether in the lab, we simply add activated three angstrom molecular sieves. In doing so, we create a situation in which the moisture is drawn into the solid molecular sieves, but the ether remains outside of those sieves in the liquid phase. And we all know how easy it is to separate a liquid from a solid. We can use a number of techniques, including filtration or decanting. When choosing which molecular sieves to use, it's important to note the sieve pore size. The sieve pore size should always be greater than the impurity that we wish to remove, 
but less than the substance that we're trying to purify itself. This ensures that only the impurities fit inside the sieves and are drawn into the solid phase. Of course, in the organic chemistry lab, we come across many different types of impurities, and we want to purify many different types of compounds. So it's important that we know the kinetic molecular diameters of each so that we can select an appropriate molecular sieve or decide if molecular sieves are even possible as a means of purifying a particular material. Let me show you how that works. Let's take a simple example. Let's say that I want to dry t-butanol. Now I can go to the literature and very easily determine that water has a kinetic molecular diameter of about 2.8 angstroms and t-butanols is about 5. What this means is that I can use activated molecular sieves of either 3 or 4 angstrom porosity. That's because either one of those sieves will fall in between the diameters of the two compounds, drawing the water in but excluding the t-butanol. But this is not always the case. Consider trying to dry acetonitrile. That could be potentially tricky because acetonitrile's kinetic molecular diameter is 3.6 angstroms. Now fortunately that means that we can use three angstrom sieves to draw water out because it falls in between the two diameters. However, if in this case we try to use activated four angstrom molecular sieves, we are unlikely to be successful because the four angstrom sieves have such large pores that both the water and acetonitrile can fit inside, and they'll quickly become saturated by the solvent that we're trying to dry. So through careful selection of pore size, we can often, though not always, remove impurities from organic materials using these very simple molecular sieves. Thanks for watching, everyone. I'm Professor Davis from ChemSurvival.com and the YouTube channel ChemSurvival, and as always, I'll see you on the next video.